Then they come up and they said, Mr. Chong, do you have any marijuana in the house? And I said, yeah. <laughs> Where is it? And this is every room in the house. <laughs> I fear this is not happening. I'm your host, Roy Wood Jr. Come with me. Did you know that nobody knows where cigar smoking even comes from? They say the northern Amazon, back in the day. Ayahuasca ceremony, stuff like that. Hey, he's married. With a good cognac, you can enjoy any cigar. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you didn't. Oh, no, you do know the origins of crack cocaine. Roy, we got a 211 in the panic room. Oh, hell no. Watch this. Oh. 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 Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Tommy Chong. Thank you. Strip clubs, man. That's where I met Cheech. <laughs> yeah, the good old days. Everybody wonders why we broke up. I'll tell you why we broke up. We got rich. <laughs> and I learned one thing, you can't make a rich Mexican do shit, boy. I say, Cheech, come on, man, we gotta work. You go, I don't think so, man. You go ahead, Eze. I'm gonna stay here and do something for my people. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna learn Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> but Gigi ended up working way more than I ever did. Man. <laughs> Mash bridges, cars, he was in everything. <laughs> what did I do? I go to jail, man. <laughs> And see, I'm a stoner. That's why I went to jail. Because the signs were there. You know, they had my house under observation for a year. They had my phone tapped. They had a helicopter going over my house. They had undercover FBI guys or DEA guys riding up on their bicycles. And you could tell that, you know, they didn't look like bike riders, you know. They're bike, <laughs> bike riders got a look, they know how to act, you know. They, these guys are, you know, <laughs> didn't, had to jump off the bike to stop it, you know. <laughs> and then they all gathered up in front of my house and they're looking in there and I'm in there making bongs, that's what I do. And yeah, they're smoking pot and they, they called me over one time and said, what, what kind of plants are those? And, Bamboo. <laughs> he said, yeah, that's interesting. So what are you making in there? I said, bongs. Oh, interesting. And then a few months later, they, they came knocking on my door in SWAT outfits. Five in the morning, man. Knocked on the door. We'd been partying, so I, I, I you know, I was asleep. I, I was dead to the world. My wife woke up. <laughs> She's someone banging at the door. So I went down there. I looked, we got glass doors, you know, and they're always open. We never lock the doors because fuck, you can never find the key, you know. That <laughs> <shit>. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the doors are always open, and, and there are these guys in their SWAT outfits and their helmets, and they got their guns and everything. And being a stoner, I wasn't the least bit afraid. You know, I wasn't scared. I wasn't doing nothing, you know. I'm not a dope dealer or escape criminal or anything like that, you know, and so I'm looking at these guys, they're looking at me. They look like trick-or-treaters, you know? <laughs> I felt the same, that's a nice costume, Sonny. <laughs> but I opened the door and they come busting in and they said, we have a warrant uh, to search your house and take your computers and shit like that. And so I'm looking at them. They're running around, you know, crazy. I'm in my little Speedos. <laughs> <laughs> it was kind of embarrassing because every, you know, guys in the morning, you know, we get a morning heart on. You know, it's not, it doesn't mean nothing. It's just nature, right? <laughs> you know, but, so I'm there with my morning heart on in my Speedos. And I forgot I had Speedos on. I forgot I had clothes on because now I got a warrant. Oh, fuck, they're arrested. What? You know, what is this? I couldn't figure out what they, you know, what they're doing. Then, then they come up and they said, Mr. Chong, do you have any marijuana in the house? And I said, yeah. 
Where is it? This is every room in the house. <laughs> he said, can you be more specific? I know, well, there's someone in my shop downstairs. On, you know, it's a nice bud, Hawaiian. Beautiful. Just got it. So he sends a guy down there, and he comes back a few minutes later. I can't find it, sir. I said, what kind of fucking DEA guys are you, man? <laughs> then he got defensive. He goes, oh, we don't have our dogs. <laughs> I said, that's another thing. How come you don't have your dogs? What the hell? <laughs> then my wife comes down the stairs. And she, she thought it was, <laughs> she was going to be on television. She thought it was, we're being punked by Ashton Kutcher. <laughs> <laughs> so she's sitting down there, all looking good, you know. <laughs> Looking for the camera. <laughs> and I had to tell her, <laughs> we're, we're being busted. She goes, well, for what? I said, I don't know. <laughs> and so I asked him, and they said, uh, uh, paraphernalia. What's that? <laughs> bongs. Oh, fuck. You're busting me for bongs? <laughs> Really? <laughs> Apparently, uh, there's one state in the union that uh, made a paraphernalia legal to ship across the state line, which is Pennsylvania, the home of the DEA. And apparently, the DEA has been trying to get my company, my son's company, to sell him bongs. And they kept refusing to sell it to him because we knew, we knew that they were DEA, or at least my son's company did. I didn't know. <laughs> and so, so anyway, they finally came to L.A. in person, bought the bongs, and then they said, listen, we're going to go on vacation here. Will you ship the bongs to us? We still wouldn't do it, so they had a, an undercover guy go in and get a job in the, my son's company, and he shipped it. He shipped it. Because it's all documented. It's all filmed, everything. We had the, all the documentation. And then they had, they've been following me for a year. And I was in Arlington, Texas one time. And they got the, the DEA camera on me. And it shows the workers in the, in the head shop all wearing DEA t-shirts. <laughs> and they kept standing next to the DEA officers. Wherever they go, they stand next to them. I still didn't catch them. <laughs> I, they're wearing headbands that didn't fit. I remember because they said to me, uh, Mr. Chong, can we talk to you outside? No, they're hippies. No. And I said, sure. They go outside, we're sitting there, and he's got his backpack in the camera, and he's got it round so he can see me. And then he said, now these uh, bongs, they're not just for tobacco use only, are they? And I said, no. I said, they're for pot. <laughs> he said, can you repeat that? I said, yeah, they're for marijuana, pot. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I still didn't know. <laughs> See, because when you don't do anything wrong, you got nothing to do, you got to be honest, you know. And so, yeah. so I go to court, and I think, well, fuck, I'll bust this, you know, because he can't bust you for bongs, you know? <laughs> and I go to court, and then they sentence me on 9-11. 9-11. No. And that, that's when I start waking up. Hey, just a minute now. <laughs> Why that date? And then Bush went on TV and said that, you know, that uh, the bong industry has been supplying money to the terrorist organizations in the tune of billions of dollars. And I'm thinking, well, fuck, I wish I had got some of that money. Because <laughs> we were in debt for a half a million bucks at the time, you know, trying to keep the bong business going. So they sentenced me to nine months. And I tried to, you know, talk my way out of it. <laughs> But again, the stoners, man. Oh. <laughs> I try to explain to the judge that I'm, I'm really sorry and that I've been working with kids, you know, trying to, you know, keep them <laughs> off drugs. Well, I've been teaching kids salsa. And the judge kind of 
look down <laughs> over his glasses, you know. The judges with no rims on their glasses, you know that look? And they look over at you. And he says, salsa? And I said, yeah, well, and this is my theory, you know, when you're dancing salsa, you can't get high and dance at the same time. <laughs> so, which in itself is a lie, because I can get high and dance salsa. <laughs> But I was trying, you know, I was, I was giving it a shot. And then I started thinking about it. Fuck, you know, I've never been to jail. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of fun, man. <laughs> and I've been prepping for this, you know, all my life. Uh, because when I was a, a teenager, you know, 15 years old, uh, I met this biker that never had, he just got out of jail, no, no place to stay. And I said, yeah, you can stay with me for a while. So he, he moved in and he gave me a biker, uh, my OG tattoo. This is a, a jailhouse tattoo. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I was really proud of this until I found out in jail it's a white supremacy tattoo. Because <laughs> <laughs> the biker that gave it to me, he only knew two tattoos. And this was one of them. But I was going to get it changed, and my son said, No, Dad, that's antique. Don't fuck with that, man. That's classic. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm in the fucking jail. And I had one bad half hour. That was when I went in, because I was treated like a celebrity. I, I, <laughs> Vanity Fair sent a limousine to take me to prison. I walk in, they handcuff me, and uh, just formality. And they apologize. I'm sorry, Mr. Chong, but we have to handcuff you. You know, it's just a formality. And I walk in the door and I got on, cuffed. That was the last time I had any handcuffs on. And then I went in, in into the dormitory where, where I was going to be living. And this guy met me. He said, took me to his locker and opened his locker. He says, anything you want, man. You know, welcome, welcome to the... Uh, Unit B, <laughs> and uh, it, was, it was a trip, man. Yeah, I, I, I'd like to go back to visit, but uh, you know. <laughs> Thank you. Tommy Chong.